All right, so let's go over what to expect about the CDA exam. All right, so there are about 65 multiple choice questions, five and plus five questions that may contain photo in a brief classroom scenario. Okay, so the exam will be time for one hour and 45 minutes. Trust me, that is more than enough time to go over those $65, those $65, um, those 65 questions for that exam, okay? Um, and next, the day of the exam, you will need a current valid photo ID with your signature, okay? So make sure it is the same information that's on your application when you're turning in your application on the your council website and all that. So make sure everything is matching. All right, so after we're done with all of that background information that you need to know, let's go ahead and begin the practice test. We will be going over 10 questions that you will be answering for your CDA exam. Now, depending on the type of credential you're going to get, it may um, alternate, but these are some general questions that you may be asked. Question number one. You are reading a book to two students and notice a third student is crying by himself near the blocks across the room. You should A. Call him over to him. Ask him what is wrong. B. Keep reading. If he needs you, he will come and get you. C. Tell him to stop crying and he's just being silly. D. Go over to the child and ask him what has happened. All right, so let's go over and break it down, okay? So it says, it says you are reading a book to two students, okay? And you have another student who is crying by himself near the blocks across the room, okay? So what is recommended? I would recommend you guys to stop what you're doing, okay? Let the other two children who you are reading to Ask them to read to each other or you guys take turns or something like that. So that right there will keep the other students occupied, okay? So you'll go over there and you'll go and talk to the student who is like angry about something, okay? Ask him why he's upset. You can say, hey, are you okay? You know, things like, are you okay? Is anything bothering you? Are you sad? Are you mad? And why? Ask them those types of questions so they can feel like their emotions are valid, okay? So you want to have a direct, di <clears throat> a direct dialogue with that student, okay? You don't want to do this in front of other students. So if he's around other students, go ahead, ask him, come here, let's talk, and pull him to the side and proceed asking those questions, okay? Um, so you guys can talk, you know, and figure out what is bothering him or bothering her, okay? And if you notice, if there's something that you can help and change or calm the situation down, go ahead and do so, okay? Um, you can also bring them to the carpet area that you are reading to the other um, students that you was reading beforehand. So... You want to make the child feel like you care about them, you care about their feelings, and you want to attend to their feelings. Question number two. Children need opportunities to share their feelings and ideas non-verbally. Which of the following is a way they can do that? A. Reading a book. B. Listening to a book on tape. C, playing with puppets. D, sliding on the slide. All right, so one of the ways that children can express themselves is playing in dramatic play. Okay, so they will need to build their nonverbal building skills. So I'll say choose the option playing with puppets. So that correlates with dramatic play. You can pretend to be anywhere you want to be they can use their imagination some of them may verbalize it and some of them want to keep it to themselves okay so they can express themselves by talking to themselves or using their brain okay so 
I know sometimes we have students who are not as social or who are still learning how to socialize. So they may just play with the dolls just by themselves and probably not even say anything, okay? Um, you can also do this with um, the dance area, the art area, um, and also I'll say blocks as well. Um, they can just be alone, be in their own headspace and not have to be verbalizing with their other students. So some students are not as social. Some of them may be a little bit introverted. So with those types of areas in your classroom, you want to provide a safe space for introverted students okay I'm one of those uh, I was one of those kids like I love just being in the art area and just coloring um I really didn't really I really didn't really interact with my classmates when I was in like early childhood um education you know as a student so having those types of nonverbal activities that can express their creativity is a good way to promote a healthy environment inside of your classroom. Question number three. You have a little girl in your class whose parents are divorcing. While her parents seem to be handling everything okay, the paternal grandmother who picks up regular is not. She often wants to chat negatively with you about her former daughter-in-law. She has no problem talking in front of her granddaughter and uses language that is not appropriate for children to hear. What should you do? A. Call the child's mother and tell her all of the awful things her former mother-in-law is saying about her. B. Meet with both parents to explain what you have been experiencing. Talk with them about how important it is to support their daughter to avoid having to hear these types of conversations. C. Tell the child's grandmother to stop gossiping and you do not appreciate it. D. Tell the child's father and mother that they can no longer pick up your student. Okay, so this question right here is a real-life classroom scenario. Uh, many times, our students go through so much at home and a lot of things we don't know, okay? And this can take a huge toll on our students. So, I recommend to you for you to meet with both parents to explain what you have been experiencing. Talk to, talk to them like, you know, I'm here to support their daughter, their her emotional needs, and I want all of us to be on the same page. You want to set clear, you know, expect, expectations to each one of those parents. I'll also say meet with the grandmother as well okay now i don't recommend you guys to put them in the same room um i really don't recommend that i recommend meeting with them separately okay uh we don't want to cause any types of drama and we're pulled inside of that drama because uh, whatever issues that this family is dealing with. We don't want to do that. So I'll say meet with them separately, okay? Say, hey, is there, you know, a day or time that we can meet up, you know, so we can discuss um, some things to support your um, daughter or whoever it is. So you want to build a trustworthy relationship with both of the parents and also with the grandmother. Question number four. The professional caregiver is a long-life learner who seeks to increase her knowledge about child development in order to help children and parents cope with typical developmental issues. Which of the following is not a developmental issue? A. Neurological damage. B. Social and emotional development. C. Cognitive development. D. Language skills. Alright, so let's go ahead and think of... What is the definition of the typical developmental issues? So when I think of that, I think of anxiety in children, ADHD, autism, um, CP, I think of conductive disorder, depression, and other disabilities that children deal with, and also 
fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So the list goes on very long of the types of issues, developing issues that children deal with within early childhood, okay? So this question is asking us, which of the following is not a developmental issue? So let's go ahead and go over each of these choices. A, neurological damage. Okay, so let me give you guys a definition of that choice right here, okay? So with this question, we need to really break it down. Now, with neurological disorders, it can appear before birth, um, during birth, and also after birth. So it can come at any time. Most of the time, it is undiagnosed. So it is very hard to really pinpoint what is going on unless they're dealing with symptoms such as seizures or some type of spinal um, injury. So let's just say a child got in a car accident. That can cause neurological damage and it will damage the nervous system that will lead to the brain. So those types of things, it may have have no impact immediately after the car, um, car accident or it can, okay? So with this, the, there's so many different like avenues with this that I'm not really, you know, a hundred percent qualified on but that those are the things that I think of when I think of saying the word neuro. I think of nervous system, um nerves, so the brain, um with muscles, um seizures of course, um muscle tones that they're not able to hold a pencil um as they should. That kinda goes with C P but if they're not actually born with C P they may have other muscle tone um issues down the line okay and also with concentration so all of this goes very deep that i'm not really qualified i'm not an, a neurologist or whatever so that is just a little bit of a glimpse of what neurological um, disorder or damage can be so i highly recommend the answer a um let's go ahead and go over the other options so we're going to go ahead and put a star on a in our heads okay so b social emotional development that can also goes with the um the definition of typical developmental issues okay so like i said emotional issues like separation anxiety dependency shyness and making new friends like we talked about earlier you will have some students who are not as social as our other students so that is the typical developmental issues that we normally see in early childhood cognitive issues relate to thinking and learning and language skills include um lacking phonological phonological um awareness such as processing influencing words okay so the answer will be a all right so after that long explanation i really had to give you guys that input all right so question number five kelsey is five years old and terrified of dogs which action is the best first step in helping her overcome her fear. A. Approaching her with a gentle dog and ask her to pat its head. B. Read books to her about children who enjoy dogs. C. Assure her that there's nothing about dogs to be afraid of. D. Having a visitor bring in a dog that responds to commands. Okay, so let's go ahead and break it down. Alright, so... One way for kids to learn new materials is by reading books and social interaction. So I recommend you guys to read books to that student, okay? So read books about dogs that did good things in a book. So I'll say Clifford <laughs> Clifford or some type of other book that makes the dog seems like it is a hero. So you can also read books like that or you can read books about children who love their pet dogs. So read that about them. Put a little excitement while you're reading that story to the class or especially to that um that child right there. I'll say read it to the entire class to to include everyone um 
Like the other um, options, I do like the having a visitor bring in a dog that responds to commands. But, I'll say check your state's requirements with animals. I know with, you know, I know some centers, they will bring someone in to have a petting zoo. So, I'm pretty sure that will be fine. But, I'm sure... But I'm pretty sure um, that dog needs to have all the shots and all the records and things like that. And it needs to be trained. So I'll say D, but for the first step, I do recommend you guys to read books um, to that student or child or children or whoever it may be. Read books to them so they can feel more comfortable. Have like a coloring page, uh, you know, of them doing great art um, crafts uh, based on dogs and things like that. So you want to have a trust building relationships um, w with that child about dogs so they can feel a little bit safe around them before you have a dog petting zoo okay so that's one of the things that i can think of then you can proceed with the other question so then you can proceed to um d then a um i'll say go with c first but the uh, the i'll say go with b then c then d and a so that's the order that i will go by Question number six. When planning for nap time routines, you should A, not allow children to bring items from home to nap with. B, be sure that the center is completely quiet so the children can sleep. C, children nap right after lunch as this when they are the most tired. D, create nap, nap time routines such as reading a book or playing soft music. Okay, so the option that I would choose is D4 right here. Now, it says create a nap time routine such as reading a book and playing soft music, okay? So, this is what I do in my classroom. Um, Before they, usually before lunch um, or before nap, they'll have their lunch. Now, before lunch, they'll be playing outside, after we come inside, they're washing hands and I will read a book or my other assistant teacher will read a book to them. Okay, so we'll read a book um, just to keep them, you know, entertained or we'll go over some type of alphabet chords. Okay, so after lunch has arrived, we'll prepare the food and then we'll have all the students to wash their hands again and, and, and we'll be seated at the table. Okay, at this time... As we're done preparing the food, we'll go ahead and play some soft music. This right here will kind of, it's kind of like a nap time alert. Like, okay, next is nap. Okay, it's like this soothing music that is very calming. And the students will, every time they hear that sound, they will associate it. Okay, we're about to take a nap. Okay, now I'm not going to say that this will make them tired, whatever, but it would kind of relax them. Okay, so after that, you're playing that soft music and all that, the students are ready for bed. You can have that playing. I say have it playing low, but not too too low. Um, so the students are able to hear, and also they're able to hear you, and you're able to hear them. Okay, so after everybody is seated, you can gradually turn up the sound a little bit. Um, I know that I have had coworkers that I worked before. They're like, "Oh my gosh, the music is so loud!" But I'll say have it somewhat loud that it can block out outside sounds inside of the classroom. For example, if I am preparing a craft and I am cutting out construction paper, I don't want the sound of me cutting paper disturb the students so i have it somewhat a little bit louder it's probably louder to people who are not trying to sleep okay you're not trying to sleep um and i don't want the students to hear what another class is doing on the other side which it which can also disturb their nap time so if you're working with infants i do recommend you to kind of turn the sound just a smidgen okay to the point that it will block out of the outside noises so they won't be disturbed if another infant is crying or if another student is crying or whatever the case may be 
question number seven. During mealtime with preschoolers, it is important to A, make sure they eat everything on their plate. B, make sure they sit in the same seat every day. C, involve them in a appropriate conversation. D, make sure lunchtime is less than 20 minutes. All right, so let's go ahead and break down these questions. So right here, I'll have to put a little bit more emphasis and explanation on each one of these choices again. All right, so let's go over A. It says make sure they eat everything on their plate. Please do not force your students to eat everything on their plate, such as eating their vegetables, drinking their milk, or whatever the case may be. If they want it, they will eat it, okay? Now, you can't encourage them to eat it, okay? Say, hey, um, did you know that carrots help you with your eyesight and, you know, whatever, just plug in some type of educational knowledge within that, especially with preschoolers, okay? So, you could create a learning environment with mealtime. Now, if they don't want to eat it, just let it go. Okay, um, don't force it. Don't make them drink their milk. Even though it has great benefits, don't force it. But you can make it a little bit fun. Like, did you know that, you know, this right here helps with that? Okay. Okay. So you could just make it somewhat interesting that they will like to eat it. But if they don't, just let it go. Now, B, make sure they sit in the same seat every day. Um, I know in my classroom... They do have their assigned seats. Um, that is that is somewhat of a... That's what they will be introduced if they go to kindergarten. Um, they will have assigned seats due to, you know, interactions and with personality. So that's what I adjust my seating charts based on. But with preschoolers, depending on the type of preschool that they're in, their age group, they may sit anywhere. And some are picky and they like to fight over seats. So it all depends on how the teacher would like to run their classroom. So that all depends. But that is not the question the answer that i would like you guys to select um i would like you guys to select the question um b involve them in a appropriate conversation um so i'll say you guys can ask questions such as what are we eating so they'll look on their plate and they will list the types of meals or items that's on their plate we're having milk. Um, some of your students may be allergic to milk, so they will call that out. We're having spaghetti, salad, and peaches. So they'll call that out. They'll list that out. You can ask them, what color are your peaches? Orange. So you can make it a learning experience with the things that's on their plates. Okay, so um, the last um, option, it says, D, make sure lunchtime is less than 20 minutes. Um, that's not a requirement, but usually they'll be done before 20 minutes. Uh, especially with preschoolers, they burn a lot of energy. So they need a lot of fuel back inside of their systems. So the answer will be involve them in a appropriate conversation. Question number eight. Your school has very little parking available. Because of this, your school has implemented a car line where parents cause a loop around the parking lot and a team of teachers assist the child out of the car and into the school. School, t school staff agrees that this has improved the morning drop-off process by keeping the children safe and allowing parents to quickly and efficiently exit the parking lot. When mother refuses to wait in the car line and parks in the lot every day going to into the school to drop her child off. Other parents have begun to complain about this behavior. What should you do? A, tell her if she doesn't follow the procedure, the child will get hit by a car. B, stand by the door so she can't get in and tell her to go in the car and drive around like the other parents. C, hey, if she doesn't follow the rules, her child cannot attend this school. D, when, a chat, when the mother comes in the next day, ask her if she has a minute to talk to you. Go to a quiet place where you guys can talk privately and explain to her why your school has the drop-off procedure in place. Assure her that she understands it and it can be frustrating to wait in line, but this is for the safety and well-being of the children and thank her for her cooperation and understanding. All right. 
I have to take a deep breath because that is a loaded question. All right, so this right here is a lot, okay? So, I'll recommend you guys to select the option D, okay? So, D says when the mother comes in the next day, talk to her privately, okay? So, I do recommend you guys to go to a quiet place. So, um, a room that's not occupied or you guys can talk during the evenings if the numbers and ratios are down. Um, go ahead and talk to her about the purpose of the drop-off line. So you can explain to her, like, for schools, if when your child enters, um, you know, school age, um, schools such as elementary, whatever, you will have to wait in a drop-off line. You just can't go park in the parking lot and just tell your child to walk up there no ma'am um you don't say that but you have to explain to her this is a safety concern right here so she has to wait in line um you don't have to say it like that but you have to make her understand this is for the safety for the student you do not want to make this conversation seems confrontational or you're trying to fight with her trying to make her seem as the bad bad parent so you want to Make her feel comfortable so she's able to speak freely. Now, I don't recommend you to um, get smart with her. And if she starts to get agitated, reassure her this is not um, this is not trying to make you feel bad. I know you're concerned that you're going to be late for work. Um, I'll give her another solution to, you know, wake up a little bit early to drop the child off. Um, things like that, you know. So you want to... You want to have a very concerning, I won't say concerning, but understanding tone with this parent. If it gets out of hand, um, I will recommend you to have your director present or near so they can explain it to them, um, to that parent. So this right here can build a, a, a relationship with you and that parent. And they will also trust your instincts. So let's just say if something happened inside of the classroom, they won't immediately go to the director. They'll come to you and you guys will have a adult conversation. So I'll say just explain why that rule or why that procedure is enforced. Question number nine. Patty's parents asked to speak with you after school. They're concerned. Patty is four years old and is not yet reading. They tell you her sister Patty was reading by the time she went to kindergarten. You listen to their concerns and tell them, A, it's clear Penny is smarter than Patty. B, children learn at different paces and reading is not a school you expect to see mastered in preschool. C, you will teach Patty to read since that is what they want. D, you too are concerned that Patty is not yet reading. Okay, so let's go ahead and break this down. Now, the correct answer for this is B. Children learn at different paces, and reading is not a skill you expect to see master in preschool. Now, even though um, phonics is introduced around this age, usually in kindergarten, depending on the type of program that you are working in, okay? So if it is a school readiness or a kindergarten readiness program, I won't say that they will learn how to read at this time, but it will be introduced. Now, it's not to say that it's going to be mastered, which is what this answer is saying right here for B. Now, you can explain to that parent that sometimes, some. well, I won't say Okay, so you want to explain explain to this parent that children l learn at different paces. So just because Penny learned how to write words, actually words, at four year old, at four years old, doesn't mean that their other child is going to learn how to do the same. Children are different; they're different type of human beings. They learn at different paces. Okay, so. Sometimes, I want you guys to keep this in mind, parents do have unrealistic expectations in preschools and also with their children. And they will hold their teachers to this very high guard 
of standard that everything is our fault and sometimes you have to explain to them all children learn at different paces okay so just because that sibling knows how to do this doesn't mean the other is going to learn how to do it so i'll just say just it's important for you guys to explain that to them and also give them what are the realistic goals that their child will be learning in preschool such as writing their names knowing their letters the sounds and things like that so whatever you guys are covering inside of your preschool curriculum Go ahead and explain to them. Um, use your background knowledge in early childhood education with the age group that you're working with and use what are the developmental stages that that child will is expected to know, okay? So explain that to them. Have some type of um, chart to go over and show that to them. Provide examples um, of the things that is expected for your preschool child to know so you want to give them a educated um, answer when you're explaining that to them question number 10 by playing on the playground a child in your class cut his hand it is a minor cut you wash it with water bandage it and the child returns outside to play what else should you do? A. Nothing. The child is fine. The cut was minor. B. Call his mother. Have her to come pick him up just in case. C. Fill out an incident report and let his mother know at pickup what has happened. D. Recheck his moon several times throughout the afternoon. Okay, so the answer that I will recommend you guys is B. Okay, so... It says fill out an incident report and let his mother know at pickup what has happened. Now, anytime there is a injury, no matter how minor, it is a good practice to document the situation with a incident report. If they if they have any questions um about what has happened, whatever, the written record that's on the incident report will let everyone know what has happened, whether it is a teacher that comes in later, if you guys are doing multiple um, shifts or you guys uh, whatever the um, scheduling may be or if the parent comes back a week later complaining about that little scratch like what has happened to his hand or whatever so having that written record has your signature your name on it, and it also has the parent's signature and date on it so if the parent wants to act like this just happened or it's brand new they already know and we have that written record already in that child's um, folder okay even though the injury is small sometimes you will encounter parents that makes a little paper cut or something that may be a little bit worse than that as it is your fault or you didn't let them know so please have a written uh, record fill that out explain what has happened what you have done let your director know let any other co-teacher know um, what has happened as well and also let the parent know if you guys are using a um, a parent communication app whether it is class dojo bright will pro care whatever the case may be message that parent as well so they can know ahead of time and have that incident report ready during pickup hold on wait Need help creating your CDA portfolio? Well, go ahead and join our CDA portfolio online course. It includes a one hour, 23 minute webinar, templates, samples, and step by step process, and it is self paced. So go ahead and roll now for $50. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and follow our website at www.persiseducator.com at your job or at your center. So it's pretty much a regular old binder. So with that binder, I recommend you guys to get a binder that's about two inches. So you're able to put in the files inside of that um, binder because you will be having a lot of documents that will probably go in and out of that binder. Now, e-portfolio. So e, pretty much like email. So it's pretty much a electronic um, upload or download or electronic access. So if you are very tech savvy and you're able to copy and paste certain um, images, certain um, documents, I highly recommend you to use that one. Um, but 
my biggest recommendation is the binder format and we will later on you know talk about that 